the Siamese twins. The Siamese twins. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the term Siamese twins derived from the famous pair of conjoined twins, Chang and Engbuka, five brothers born in Siam, now Thailand. For many years, they traveled with the P.T. Barnacombs Circus and were labeled the Siamese twins. They were an uncommon type of Siamese twins called Cyphogus, two bodies fused in the Cyphite cartilage, which is approximately from the navel to the lower breast bone. These type of twins almost never share any vital organs with the exception of the liver. Now due to the brothers' fame and rareness of their condition, the term Siamese twins came to be utilized as another phrase for conjoined twins. Cheng and Eng were not, of course, the first ever instance of conjoined twins. The earliest depiction of the condition dates back to the Neolithic era found in Anatolia of two ample women joined at the hip. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Siamese twins, and we are waiting, and the Siamese twins are identical twins that are joined in the womb. It is a rare phenomenon, okay, we'll go back to the paper. It is a rare phenomenon with an estimated range from 1 in 49,000 births to 1 in 189,000 births. In countries such as Southwest Asia, Africa, and Brazil, there are higher occurrences. It is important to note that the condition is more frequently found among females than that of males, of a ratio of 3 to 1. There are two views that exist to explain the origin of Siamese twins. The first view um, is called fission, which states that the fertilized egg splits partially. The second perspective is held by most, is called fusion. This view states that a fertilized egg completely separates stem cells, fine-like stem cells, and other twins and fuse the twins together. There is no solid explanation as to what causes either view to transpire. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Siamese twins are typically categorized by the point at which their bodies are joined. Joined at the chest. One of the most of conjoined twins, Thoracopus twins, are joined at the chest. They, are oft they often share a heart and may also share one liver and an upper intestine. Joined near the belly button. Omphalogous twins are joined near the belly button. Many omphalogous twins share the liver and some share the lower part of the small intestine and colon. They generally do not, however, share heart. Joined at the base of the spine. Pygopagus twins are joined at the base of the spine and commonly face away from another. Some Pygopagus twins share the lower gastrointestinal tract and a few share the genital and urinary, urinary organs. Joined at the pelvis. Ischiopagus twins are joined at the pelvis. Many Ischiopagus twins share the lower gastrointestinal tract as well as the liver and genital and urinary tract organs. Each twin may have two legs or in some cases one pair of legs and even a fused leg, though that's uncommon. Join at the head. Craniopagus twins are joined at the head. Now, craniopagus twins, ladies and gentlemen, share a portion of the skull and possibly the brain tissue. This sharing may involve the cerebral cortex, the parts of the brain that plays a central role in memory, language, and perception. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a Siamese twins that many have tried to separate but wasn't successful. Some say they fight against each other. Some say what this twin speak about is irrelevant, not true, not inspired, and never come to pass. Or some say that one has died and only the other lives. Some have tried to pronounce that both were dead. But ladies and gentlemen, the Siamese twins I am talking about is the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible, the Old Testament, and the New Testament. Yeah. Hmm.
Now the Bible is made up of six to six books. These books are subdivided into two main sections, what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now the Old Testament comprises of 39 of those books, while the New Testament comprises of 27. The Old Testament can be further subdivided into the law, history, poetry, major prophets, and minor prophets. The New Testament is divided into the gospel, history, letters, and prophecy. Now there are some organizations that believe that only the New Testament are for all times today, and they believe that the Old Testament has been nailed to the cross. There are also some individuals who only believe in the Old Testament. Let's see what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, and that is slide 13. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Let us go on, reader. Tell us, tell us, reader. All scripture is given by the inspiration What did he say? Did he say some scripture? No. Did he say half the scripture? No. Did he say 99% of the scripture? He said all oh, the scripture. Continue, reader. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Amen, amen, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible never said that. The Bible never said that. The Bible never said that. The, yeah, come again. The Bible never said that. The Bible never said that some scripture was given by the inspiration of God. Come again. The Bible never said that some scripture was given by the inspiration of man. Come again. More scripture was, was the Bible never said that more scripture was given by the inspiration of God. The Bible never said that more scripture was given by the inspiration of man. Nor did the Bible ever say all scripture was given by the inspiration of man. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible said that all scripture was given by the inspiration of God. Oh, tell me about it. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I'm, I don't just want to be a New Testament believer. I don't just want to be an Old Testament believer, but I want to be a B-I-B-L-E, a Bible believer. I don't want quarter truth. I don't want half truth. I don't want two-thirds truth, but I want nothing but the entire truth. Amen. Amen. Now, it's important to know that even though the Bible was the inspiration of God, it was written on three different continents. Africa, Europe, and Asia. <laughs> three different languages. Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. By almost 40 different people. Kings, shepherds, scientists, attorneys, and an army general, fisherman, priest, and a physician by authors of various educational backgrounds. It was written over 1,500 years, but ladies and gentlemen, I wanna let you know that despite all of this, despite all of this, ladies and gentlemen, we know that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. For so the, the prophet, go ahead, go ahead, read up. For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy. yes, tell us about it. The Bible tells us that it was not by the will of man that the Bible was written, but rather by the will of God. Holy men of God, in other words, Christians were inspired by the Holy Ghost and they wrote. No, they did not write verbatim, that is, word for word, but they were inspired, but they, but they used their own words and ways of expression. Therefore, the Bible is not the word of man, but the word of God. Amen. The Bible is not man's word about God, but rather God's word to man. Amen. Now, some people say, ladies and gentlemen, that the Bible contradicts itself, and as a result, they reject it. But the real truth is that people do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. So True. put it on the screen, tell us. It opposes the adultery they're committing. Put it on the screen. It opposes the rum they're drinking. Put it on the screen. It opposes the habit of smoking. It opposes the constant gossiping. It opposes the idea of partying. Come on, man. It opposes the 
practice of gambling. Come on, come on. It opposes their lifestyle. Ladies and gentlemen, put it on the screen, brother. Put it on the screen. We reject the truth because we reject the Bible because we do not want to hear the truth. The Bible tells us in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Mm. Now, one of the greatest admirable features of the Bible is its unity. Ladies and gentlemen, as we said earlier, it was written on three continents and three languages by about 40 different people over a period of 1,500 years on the most controversial uh, t topics uh, by people who in most cases had never met, by authors whose education and background varied greatly. Despite these factors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the 66 books of the Bible maintain harmony with each, with each other. Yeah. Often new concepts on a subject are expressed but these concepts do not undermine what other authors had to say. Talk about something astounding. Ask people to, 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 to have viewed an identical event and ask them to each give a report of what happen, happened. They will differ widely and will virtually always contradict each other. Yet the Bible, penned by 40 writers over a 1500 period, reads as if it was written by one great mind. Yeah. And indeed it was. Holy men of God yeah. speak as they were moved yeah. by the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Second Peter 1 2. Ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit moved them all. So he is the real author. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the New Testament does not contradict the Old Testament. In fact, they both complement each other. Let us look at 12 prophecies made in the Old Testament of the coming Messiah and the fulfillment in the life, in the New Testament, in the life of Jesus. So the Bible told, the prophecy was, born in Bethlehem, that, that the Messiah would be would born in Bethlehem. Old Testament scripture, Micah 5.2. So you can write these out because you won't be able to go through them tonight. New Testament fulfillment, Matthew 2.1. Born of a virgin, Isaiah 7.14. New Testament fulfillment, Matthew 1, 18 to 23. Of David's lineage, Jeremiah 23 and verse 5. New Testament fulfillment, Revelation 22 and verse 16. Attempted murder by Herod, Jeremiah 31 and verse 15. New Testament fulfillment, Matthew 2, 16 to 18. Betrayal by a friend, Psalms 41 and verse 9. New Testament fulfillment, John 13, Verses 18, 19, and 26. Sold for 30 silver coins, Zechariah 11, 12. New Testament fulfillment, Matthew 26, 14 to 16. Crucified, Zechariah 12, 10. New Testament fulfillment, John 19, 16 to 18 and 37. Lots cast for his clothes. Psalms 28, verse 18. Matt, that, yes, correct. Psalms 28 and verse 18. Let's, oh. Psalms 22 in verse 18. Let's read together. Matthew chapter 27, verse 35. No bones broken. Psalms 34, verse 20. Exodus 12, 46. New Testament fulfillment. John 19, 31 to 36. Buried in rich man's tomb. Isaiah 53, verse 9. And Matthew 27, verses 57 to 60. Year, day, hour of his death. Daniel 9, 26 and 27. Exodus 12 and verse 6. New Testament fulfillment. Matthew 27, verses 45 to 50. Raise the third day. Hosea 6, 2. New Testament fulfillment. Acts 10, 38 to 40. Ladies and gentlemen, we can indeed see that the Old Testament, not the New Testament, contradict each other, but they uplift each other. Yeah. Bible predictions of things to happen in the future also confirm the inspiration of scripture as they come to pass. Notice the following examples of fulfilled Bible prophecy. Four world empires to arise. Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome. And we can see through history that all these 
nations has already rise. Check Daniel chapters 2, 7, and 8. Cyrus to be the warrior to capture Babylon. Isaiah 45, verse 1 to 3, and this has already happened. After Babylon's destruction, it would never be inhabited again. Isaiah 13. <laughs> Bring it back. Isaiah 13, 19 to 20. Jeremiah 51 and verse 37. Go ahead now, you can go. Egypt would never again have caught a commanding position among the nations. Ezekiel 29 verse 14. Of shaking calamities, of shaking calamities, and fear toward the end of time. And ladies and gentlemen, we can see in our world today, we have so many natural disasters, so many earthquakes, people killing one another. So we can indeed see that in the time that we are living in, this has been fulfilled. Moral degeneracy and the decline of spirituality in the last days. 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 5 in the Bible tells us that men shall become lovers of pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, people no longer have uh, 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 pride for morality. People don't have, no longer have pride for spirituality. In fact, we only look for a form of godliness. So we can see that Bible predictions, you know, ensure, show, ensure, assures us that the Bible is true. And we can see that all these predictions came to pass. Yeah. Now, scientists um, claim that the Bible is limited. But scientists fail to recognize that they are limited from the moment they approach the Bible. Right. Scientists use the five sensory perception, such as to hear, to see, to smell, to taste, and to touch, to determine the authenticity of the Bible. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible mentions of a sixth sense which is called faith. Put it on the screen. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Let's go together, reader. No, no faith, faith is the substance, substance of things, things hoped for, the evidence, evidence of, of things, things not, not seen. seen. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to let you know that you don't, if you don't have faith, you will never see the authenticity of the Bible whose premises are based upon faith. Ladies and gentlemen, people put, people put, people put their faith in planes. They put their faith in vehicles. They put their faith in doctors. They put their faith in the news. Continue, continue. They put their faith in their finances. They put their faith in their houses and land. They put their faith in the government. But the only thing they find it hard to do is put their trust in the word of God. Hmm. Now scientists want to mess with the Bible? Huh? They want to mess with the Bible? Do you really want to mess with the Bible? Now let's look, let, let's look at this now. The Bible and us we float in space. At a time when it was believed that the earth sat on a large animal, a giant in 1500 BC. The Bible spoke of the earth's free float in space. Job chapter 26 and verse 7. Let's read it together, reader. He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon the earth. You don't know what I'm talking about. Scientists did not discover the earth, that the earth hangs upon nothing until 1650. Until 1650. And you're going to trust science? Until 1650, they didn't discover it. Now the scripture speaks of an invisible structure. Only in recent years has science discovered that everything we see is composed of things that we cannot see, called invisible atoms. Now the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3, written 2,000 years ago, let's read it together. Through faith, faith we, we understand, understand that, that words were framed by the word of man, God. by the word of man, God. by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do not appear, which do not appear, which do appear. Which do appear. Very good, ladies and gentlemen, which do appear. So we can see that before scientists even discovered that atoms exist. 
God already declared it in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. Amen. The Bible reveals that the earth is round. Isaiah 40, 22. Read it for us. Read it for us. Read up. The scriptures tell us that the earth is round. It is... It is he that sits upon the, upon the circle of the earth. Amen. It is he that sits upon the circle of the earth. The word translated circle is here in the Hebrew word shrug, which also translated socket or compass. That is, it indicates something spherical, rounded or arched, not something flat and square. The book Isaiah was written around the time 70 BC. This is at least 300 years before Aristotle suggested in his book on the heavens that the earth might be sphere. It wasn't until another 2,000 years later at a time when scientists thought that earth was flat, scripture inspired Christopher Columbus to sail across the earth to prove that the world was round. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but I can't help but to trust the Bible. I can't help but to put my confidence in the Bible. I don't know about you, but the Bible has never failed me yet. Isaiah 48 says that the grass will erect, the flower faded, but the word of our God will stand forever. Hmm. The Bible said the wind has weight. Hmm. Scientists want to play them genius now. Now long before a mathematician named Evangelista Torricelli performed an experiment in 1643 and learned that air has weight, the scripture declared in Job 28 and verses 25, let's read, read up, to make the weight for the winds, and he weighed the waters by measure. Hmm, so we can see ladies and gentlemen, that even before these people think about them and experience, even before they were born, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible already told us that the wind has weight. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to let you know that the greatest scientist who ever walked upon this earth is Jesus Christ. And I want to let you know that true science and the word of God goes hand in hand. Hmm. Now the Old Testament and the New Testament is a special type of Siamese twins. They are joined by the head. They are joined by the heart. They are joined by the heart. They are joined by the feet. Great ladies and gentlemen, I want to let you know that united they stand, but divided they fall. The man who unites the Bible, in, in the, the, who unites the Old Testament and the New Testament, ladies and gentlemen, is Jesus Christ himself. I don't know about you, but one author profoundly stated, to know Christ, the living word, you must love the Bible, the written word. Talk about the Bible, let's go back to the Old Testament. The Old Testament tells us that he, in Isaiah, he was wounded for transgressions. He was bruised for iniquity. The chastisement of all peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. But it doesn't end there. The New Testament came and endorsed it, and it came to pass. In John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. I don't know about you ladies and gentlemen. But I can assure you that the word of God will stand forever. Amen. Now Jesus himself demonstrated his confidence in God's word. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4 says, let's go read up. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. But by some word that proceeded out of the every mouth of God. Word. Every. But by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of man, God. but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of Satan, God. but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of Pastor Brown, God. but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of Pastor Philbert, God. but by every word that proceeded 
out of the mouth of God. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible tells us that Jesus used scripture to overcome every trial and test. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a blessing to believe in the Bible. Yes. It is a source of truth. It is 100% reliable and accurate. It gives con guidance, correction, and instruction. It is a source of truth and a source of true science. It is a road map for life and salvation. It tells you God's will. It never goes outdated and never needs to be updated or upgraded. Upgraded. Proverbs verse 13, 5 says, Every word of God is true. Every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Politicians' words may fail you. Lawyers' words may fail you. Doctors' words may fail you. Psychologists' words may fail you. Scientists' words may fail you. Your parents' words may fail you. Oh, Pastor Simon's words may fail you. My words may fail you. Oh, Pastor Philbert's words may fail you. Your teacher's words may fail you. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but a lot of individuals' words may fail you. But I can testify in my own life of how the Bible has been a blessing to me. You see, if it wasn't for the Bible, I wouldn't be standing here today. I wouldn't be proclaiming God's message after 10 years being washed by the blood. I don't know about you today, but I can stand proud reading that Bible because I know what it has done for me. You see, you can't just read the Bible. You have to allow the Bible to become a part of you. It's like you become the living bird. You don't know what I'm talking about. You become like the Logos because we are supposed to be Christ center. Ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to become a Seventh day Adventist Christian. But thanks to that Bible and reading the word that had given me the courage to move forward. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, as I stand here today, I know some of you have heard it before. But if it wasn't for the word, I wouldn't be here. Because when I was about to give my life to Jesus, my parents weren't at my baptism. They were home. And in fact, our family were going through some challenges. Challenges that I thought would have never helped me to get any better. It just seemed as if it was pushing me down and down. And night after night I would cry. But ladies and gentlemen, a friend introduced me to the B-I-B-L-E. The Bible book. The book that has stood the test of time. Oh, the book that has, has, has beat medical science. That has beat politicians. That has beat everyone upon this, upon this earth, ladies and gentlemen. And when I read this book, it started to transform my life. Oh yes, when I thought my parents' marriage would have never come back together. I want to let you know, I am one who never believe in divorce. Believe divorce is for quitters. You know, not people who are strong. You know, people who are strong or Christians would give their marriage a second chance, man. They would go to their knees and go to Jesus. But I want to let you know, the, the greatest marriage counselor is not a pastor. The greatest marriage counselor is the word of God. It tells you how you're supposed to treat one another. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to hear about that, come on, on, I think it's Tuesday, the right way to do it. So as I said, I went on my knees and I read that Bible. And I decided, you know what? I would give my life to Jesus. And when I gave my life to Jesus, even though my parents wasn't there, you know, I was confident that one day they will soon join me. So I continued to read the power of of God, ladies and gentlemen. I read it night after night. And thanks to the encouragement of a friend that hold my hand when I felt like giving up. Even when, when things seemed a bit rough, uh, you know, that friend would call me. Even my mom, when she wasn't a seven Adventist Christian, she made her aim that you, you made this decision for Christ. You're going to go through it, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to go through it. So I can remember just being there crying and hoping that my parents' marriage would come together. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to let you know that with that word, my parents' marriage came back together like a piece of puzzle. Puzzle, and she can stand here and let you know it, testify what God has done for us as a family. You know, she can tell you that she's married for 23 years, you know, 23 blessed years. You see, no marriage is never too broken to be fixed. So I continue reading the Bible. And I said, you know what? 
I want to become a pastor. My dad never supported the idea. He never once supported He said he's not spending his money, wasting his money on something like that when they have 1860 subjects and nine camp units. He's not spending his money for something like that. But I said, guess what? You know what, guess what? You're just my earthly father. Now the Bible tells me about a father of a godfather who will never leave me God for sake. You don't know what I'm talking about. You don't know what I'm talking about, eh? You don't get the idea. You don't know what I'm talking about. You don't know what I'm talking about. You're too quiet in this place to know what I'm talking about. You're too quiet. You're too quiet. So hear what? I continue reading the Bible. Continue reading. I continue praying. You know? He said that he's not going to pray. Listen up. He said that he's not going to pray. So anyways, in 2008, you know, he want to play bad boy, fisherman, you know, he's, 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 he's the greatest fisherman of all, but he doesn't know that Jesus is the, is the greatest fisherman of all time. So he went out to fishing, man. He went out to fishing all confident, believing that he would catch so many, so many lobsters and so many crayfish, so many crabs and so many fish, but I know what my God does. You don't understand what I'm talking about. I know what my God does. And Samuel Ignacio Webster's word cannot be the word of God. Neither can Judith Webster's word be the word of God. You know, I respect them, but I respect God before I respect them. So, so let, let me continue talking about it, man. So, so, so anyways, he got out to fish. And while coming back, he saw this fish trap that he hadn't seen for many years. This fish trap that he never seen for many years. So he went to try it, to, 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 to get it. But ladies and gentlemen, instead of throwing on the boat, he made boat and made, he made a mistake and shoved the gear shift forward and that caused him to fall out of the boat. Now the boat was gone. And he was left 15 miles east of Anguilla in shark infested waters. What to do? I am the great fisherman of all time. So let's see now, let's see now how I'm going to do this. You know, I don't need Jesus, so let's see how we're going. But ladies and gentlemen, he remembered the scripture. And Jeremiah, wait, wait, wait it, came, it came from science? It came from television? I, oh, it came from, came from the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3, a scripture that my mother would always tell him. And it says, call unto me, and I'll answer thee, and I'll show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. So ladies and gentlemen, we call upon the name of Jesus to help him, to help him find food. Boys, man, I don't know about you, he sought to swim for an hour and a half. You see, sometimes Jesus wants you to have some patience. He wants you to be like Job. Though he, he, you, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You don't know what I'm talking about. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So yes, listen to this now, listen to this. So yes, he's out there. He's out there starting to, to sing hymns he never sang before. Oh, he started to sing the hymns when he was a little boy in Sabbath school. Oh, those songs that he learned in Pathfinders. He started to sing. You see, when you stray away from God and you've been growing the truth when you were young, everything will come to come back. That's why you must take the same Bible and instill the bowels and values in your children if you want to make a better society. If you want to make a better home, it's the only thing that you can go to is the B I B L E. Oh, yeah. So yes, he swam for one and a half, and he found two boys. But you know, he started to feel confident. You know that these two boys can save your man. But God intensified his man. So he decided he's gonna allow the, the tide to come. So the water started to rise. The water started to rise, and he had to pray to Jesus, man. He remember all those words. He remember, ask and it shall be given unto you. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, he prayed to God. He said, God help me to allow these boys to be loose, to get, to get them loose. So he went down deep beneath the water. And this is like 12 miles east of Angola, you know. He's going down in the deep water. And magically, that magically, no, no, no. That's science, that's, you know, devil words, the devil words. The work, the power of God allowed him to, to, to unloose that rope. And he tied it to himself. So now, now he believed that you know, all was well. And his boat had really left him, so he started to think. And he said, God, I want you to do three things for me. I want you to allow my boat to run out of gas. I want the sun to come up hot the next day. So God, the next day, God answered his prayers. His boat went out of gas. And, his, and the sun came up, hot, 
very hard because he was cool. 22 and a half hours he spent. And ladies and gentlemen, I can remember the news when they said that his boat was found, but he was not in it. And my mom said, kids, while we're in tears, she's our confident kids. And she's not a seven Adventist Christian at that time. She said, kids, the word of God never fails. Amen. Never ever fails. People came by our house and said, you're in denial. She said that my Bible tells me that my God is not a victim, but he's a victor. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. He is a victor. So, 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 so she said, I rebuke your words in the name of Jesus. Because I know that my, um, my husband is out there. It's for you to go out there and find him. He's not going to give up so easy. And I know that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So ladies and gentlemen, my dad was out there. And he asked God to, give, to send him some water to drink. Mind it was a very sunny day and all of a sudden this one cloud came out of nowhere and, and turned gray and it started to sprinkle some water right where he was. And he said that was the best water he ever tasted. He believed that it was the, the living water. You know what? He believed it was drinking Jesus. But ladies and gentlemen, while on the water, he said, you know what? He should be found by Tuesday. He should be found by Tuesday. Hmm, he should be found by Tuesday. But you see, he, there was a reason why God wasn't um, rescuing him as yet because he was looking at man to rescue him. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, he came at a point in time where he said, but God, if you did all these things for me, if you did all these things for me in the past, I know you can do many more things in the present and in the future. You don't need, I don't need to wait until choose it to be found because you yourself can rescue me. Ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't until like five minutes later, a boat came his direction, saw two boys in the water. So they, they say they see, they, they see something. So he throw them up in the air and they say, I see two boys. So they, the people on the boat ask where, so he pries himself of the water. And ladies and gentlemen, God used men to scoop him out of the water. Today I want to let you know that he was baptized in 2008 and is serving God more than ever before. I want to let you know that he was the same one. You, you, you don't understand? He was the same one who paid for my tuition that he said that he would never pay. I want to let you know that God can change even the heart, the heart of an atheist. He can change someone who wants to be so, so rock hard. He can move the unmovable. He can do the impossible because guess what? He's the king of kings. He he is the Lord of Lords. He has for thy be all sufficient. He not an eye. He's the master and Lord. He's the one that has set me free from the bondage of sin. He's the one that makes a way where there seems to be no way. He's the one, ladies and gentlemen, who sent his son on Calvary's cross, who took all the splendor of heaven, put upon him um, sin, uh, a human body, went upon this earth, was beaten, battered, and bruised. Wounded, tormented, and torn. But ladies and gentlemen, he died for me and you. And that's what my Bible tells me. My Bible tells me that God can do anything. And if he can do anything, I believe that he can do it for you. He can do it for you tonight. But you have to trust his word. I don't know, but I believe in the word of God. The Bible says, that change the change lives of those who follow Jesus and obey scripture constitute the most heartwarming proof of Bible inspiration. The drunkard becomes sober, the immoral pure, the addicted free, the profane reverent, the fearful courageous, and the rude kind. Hebrews chapter 4 in verse 12 tells us, and it tells us, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of sword and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a dishonor of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Prayer changes, but also God will transform the lives of people. The Old Testament and the New Testament are Siamese twins that can never, can never be separated and they are still the truth for today. Indeed, they are not man's words of God but God's words to man. Amen. The Bible predictions always comes to pass and it is the book of true science. Jesus himself demonstrated confidence 
and experience over sin through the word of God. If Jesus followed God's word, then we should too.